There's a story I heard of a blind woman who, because she was blind, she had a Braille Bible, and so she would read her Bible by feeling the, the, the Braille uh, and read it that way and come to understand it, but she had a terrible accident one day where she uh, was, there was a fire and she had her hands burned to where she no longer had the feeling in her fingertips like she used to, and all of a sudden she was not able to read her Bible like she used to. And this really bothered her. Uh, this made it so that she could not every day read and take in the Word of God so that she could hear the message and so that she could dwell on it. And this was just making her so sad until one day she was sad about this and she picked up her Braille Bible and <laughs> feeling sad and longing for it, she kissed her Bible. And then at that moment she realized that she had the same feeling on her lips that she used to have on her fingertips. And she was able to then go through and read again her Bible instead of feeling it with her hands by going through kissing each and every line of each and every page. Uh, that story has always touched me, and it just raises up a question about how we feel about reading our Bibles. You could ask yourself, if I could never read my Bible again, would it bother me? If I could never go to church again, would it really bother me? You know, in the normal course of life, we all go through trials and tribulations and things come which challenge us and which test our faith. But I'm afraid that oftentimes when we go through trials, we find ourselves uh, just putting off serving the Lord and maybe just not becoming productive in spiritual things anymore. But what we need to remember is that God's truth has been given to us so that we could be comforted in those times and so that we would be able to endure through those times and still be able to obey God. And so what we're doing this morning as we're looking at this uh, new study that I want to start in 1 Peter is we are re-examining God's word, what he says here, and we are wanting to refocus our attention to what his will is for us. And that's exactly what we need whenever we're going through a hard time or whenever we're about to go through a hard time. And we can read about what is pleasing to God in our life. And the next following verses, not today, but uh, in, in Lord willing, next week is going to be talking about the gospel. And so there's different parts of this book where it talks about uh, the gospel. And sometimes we think to ourselves, if I'm already a Christian, I don't need that. But the truth is, even if we're saved, we do still need to hear the gospel because it plays a part in our life where uh, we, we get down or we get depressed or something. And we want to, what we want to do is look back to the cross, look to Jesus Christ and what he did for us. And we can be reminded, you see, of what God has already done for us. And that's supposed to encourage us and that's supposed to uplift us and bring us to a place where, again, we can glorify God and we can serve him and worship him and how it is that we live. So the gospel is not just for unbelievers. The gospel is for believers too. Well, our society is becoming increasingly hostile to the Christian faith and to the things that we believe in that are found in God's word. And as time goes on, I believe it's going to get worse and worse if the Lord tarries and, and the rapture doesn't happen soon. Things are going to get much worse in our society. And uh, even though we don't experience the same persecution that many Christians do in other parts of the world, you might say that things are starting to get into the realm of oppression where people are trying to pressure us into thinking certain things and pressuring us into behaving a certain way. And so as times move in that direction, we need to be ready and we need to, ahead of time, look at God's word and see what it is that we need to remember in those times when it gets Worse. And so primarily, Peter is writing to people who are about to be going through a period of very serious persecution. And so that's mainly what this is talking about. But I believe that the principles that are presented in this book also apply to many of the everyday trials that we go through and that we run into every day. And so we can look to this portion of scripture and we can take comfort in it. Well, in the portion that was read for us already, we can turn in our Bibles, if you're not there already, to 1 Peter chapter 1, and let's look at verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, this is the beginning of an epistle, the beginning of a letter. And so this is the normal salutation that you would find in an epistle of the first century. And so we have the author identifying himself. That's the first thing we see is 
Peter. Uh, Peter, he is the man who many people uh, call a pope. They say that he was a pope, but really that's not found in the word of God anywhere. Uh, whenever we see Peter describing himself, he does call himself certain things, but he never calls himself uh, a pope. Later in chapter 5, verse 1, Peter calls himself an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And so he saw himself in a way as, a, as an elder and as a pastor. Um, but here in this verse, we see how it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So he calls himself an apostle. Uh, this word is a word that refers to an emissary or a messenger who operated with the full authority of the one by whom he was sent. And so this word is used in two different ways in the New Testament. Sometimes it's used in a non-technical sense, where in that way it is talking about just anybody in general that might be sent on behalf of another in just regular situations. But then there are, there's another way in which the word is used, where it is used in a very technical sense to refer to the, the disciples of Jesus and to the, the apostles and later to the apostle Paul who was the apostle to the Gentiles. And so something about those, those special apostles is that every single one of them, this is important, every single one of them were commissioned directly by Jesus for the proclamation of the gospel. And that's something that has to be true of anyone that would be an apostle. And so each and every one of us, we're apostles in the first sense, in the sense of just a general uh, person who's sent with a message ahead uh, on behalf of God. Uh, and so really the, the message of the gospel is supposed to go forward uh, by all of us. It's not just one person or a few people uh, that the, the work is supposed to be done in sharing uh, the gospel. And so we want to uh, be thinking about what it is the message that we're supposed to be carrying to, to other people. And as we look at these first few verses of this this wonderful letter in God's word, we can review the truths about salvation that God has told us, and we can think to ourselves, wow, God really did that for me, and I can share that with other people. Well, Peter calls himself an apostle here. He's talking about this in a technical sense. He is one of the 12 disciples of of Jesus who is writing this. Now, now Peter, he was just a regular average guy. He grew up in, in a small town in Galilee, and he was a fisherman by trade. And so there was nothing really special about him in his early life. He wasn't perfect by any means at all. And he didn't always say the right things. Sometimes he would say things that were, that were very profound, and other times he would say things that, that were really wrong and that he really shouldn't have said and maybe he regretted. Uh, at least one preacher has called him the disciple with the foot-shaped mouth <laughs> because of the things that he said, and maybe that's an appropriate uh, uh, label for him. But someone might say, well, if he's just a, that regular guy from a small town, can God really use a person like that? You know what, let me tell you something. God can use a person like that. And we need to remember that even though we might get into moments where we feel like, you know, I am too small for God to be using me, or I am not intelligent enough for God to be using me, or I'm not good enough, I'm not a good enough person for God to, to be using me. But I want you to know that when you feel like that, that is exactly where God wants you. And the reason is because the moment you start thinking to yourself, well, God couldn't have picked a better servant than me. I am, I am perfectly qualified and I have all the things that I need in order to serve God. The moment you start thinking that, you're trusting only in yourself and only in your own strength without God. And that's the time when you're going to fall flat on your face. God wants us to come to him humbly and to come to him willingly and to come to him recognizing that we have to find our strength in him. God wants broken people to help to serve him. God wants weak people to serve him. God wants desperate people to serve him so that we would totally rely on him. Well, Peter, there's a number of passages where Peter uh, comes out prominently in the New Testament and just a few of them to remind you of. This is the Peter who saw Jesus walking on the water in the, in the sea, and he asked that he could go walk too, and Jesus invited him, and he went out onto the sea. He was able to walk on the water just like Jesus for a brief moment, uh, but then when his faith faltered, he began to sink. Uh, this is the Peter who, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he asked, who do you say that I am? This is the Peter who said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
This is the Peter who, after initially rejecting Jesus' offer to wash his feet, once he came to realize that it had everything to do with having fellowship with Jesus, he, sa he said, uh, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Uh, this is the Peter who, uh, at, at one point, denied Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. Sometimes I think about the account in the Gospel of John when John and Peter had heard of Jesus' resurrection and they hadn't seen him yet. And so they were excited and they were running to the tomb. You remember this account? They're running to the tomb and John, who in his own Gospel, he records himself as getting to the tomb before Peter, right? I find that funny. And, um, and so he beat him there. He was a faster runner. But then, then John stops at the entrance of the tomb and then... Peter, though, in his typical rash fashion, he goes bolting right into the place. He goes right into the tomb, doesn't he? And that shows something of his, uh, his character, of, of Peter's character. But ultimately, God used Peter mightily. He took him from just an average, regular guy from a small town, and he used him so that he could do great things in God's power. He even preached the first sermon of the church on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter Two. And so this is the man who wrote the book and the words that we're reading under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit uh, of God. And so uh, Peter is writing now, later in life, as an experienced man. He is an old man, and he's reached a point in his maturity where he's able to teach people and instruct others in spiritual things. He is more than qualified for us to look at what he says. Well, he's apparently not alone in writing this letter. If you go over for a moment to chapter 5 of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, and as the letter gets to its conclusion, it says in chapter 5, verse 12, By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. But she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark. My son, you can go back to chapter 1. Uh, what we discover there is that Sylvanus is there with Peter, and he's apparently uh, dictating the words of Peter, writing them down for him, uh, so that uh, he, would, he would be the one writing, actually writing down uh, the words. Oh, we also see the man Mark uh, named. This is uh, probably the same Mark who wrote the Gospel of, of Mark, and so they are apparently together as this is getting taken down. Well, not only do we see the, the writer of the epistle, in the second part of the verse, we see who he's writing to. Notice again, it says, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, it says, to the pilgrims in my new, new King James. In the King James, it says, to the strangers. In some Bibles, it might say the word aliens here. This is talking about uh, uh, Jewish believers, but there were also Gentile believers among them who were, they were scattered, you see, into these other lands that are mentioned in this verse, away from their traditional home, which was in Judea, in the land, the, the promised land there in Israel. And um, so uh, Peter is, is writing to them, who, who the, he's pointing out the fact that they're, they're pilgrims, uh, that they are away from from that land. And obviously, he's wanting us not just to think about the physical place uh, where they're dwelling. He's wanting to, us, to, us to focus our attention um, to the spiritual and to the fact that if we are a believer in Jesus Christ, then we are living here temporarily on this earth, but it is not our home because we're told in the book of Philippians that we have a citizenship in heaven, right? And someday we're all going to leave this. Uh, this life, our, our life is going to come to an end, and it's just a question of, well, where are we going to go? Well, for the Christian, uh, we're going to go to heaven, uh, to the place where we really belong, and that's the place where we're going to find comfort, and that's the place where we're going to get to spend all eternity with Jesus forever. But for this time, this temporary time, we're in this place that isn't, isn't quite where we're the most comfortable, <laughs> and uh, we, are, we are here in this world. And so these people, these, these believers, they're in these different locations. Uh, these these uh, cities and these lands, uh, they are places that are in modern day Turkey. And so that is generally where these people are. You think about sometimes when you go on vacation, uh, do you ever go on a really long trip on vacation? It's really nice to go out and do something different, isn't it? But well, sometimes when I'm on vacation or if I take a long trip, I think to myself after a couple of days, <laughs> 
man, I just really love to go home. <laughs> you know, sometimes at some point you just want to get home, get your laundry done and relax for a day or two. <laughs> you know, so maybe it's good to plan vacation that way. Uh, but I think about that as I think about these believers wanting to, to uh, be in their, their home. This letter was written somewhere in the range of 63 to 64 AD. So that places the dating of this epistle uh, somewhere in the region of the first great persecution by the Roman government. And so this either was written right at the beginning of that persecution or some believe right before that persecution. So either way, however you take it, uh, these words, again, are intended to bring comfort to these people who would really need it. Uh, they, they either were going through some really tough times or they were about to go through some really tough times. And so we can be looking at this and thinking, well, what is it that God wants us to know in those kinds of uh, of times. Well, up until this point, generally speaking, the Christians had been tolerated by the Roman government. They were thought of as being a sect of the Jews, and they weren't um, illegal. Uh, it wasn't illegal to be a Christian, but uh, they were about, things were about to get a lot worse for them. So the theme of this epistle, the theme, is grace in the midst of suffering. Grace in the midst uh, of suffering. And so we're supposed to find, again, comfort, instruction, encouragement, in times of great spiritual attack. Uh, people oftentimes need help getting through day by day. I don't know about you, but I need help on a regular basis from God to get through my day so that I can uh, keep, just keep myself centered, keep myself focused as a Christian, especially when we have all the distractions of the world around us and we have all the pressures from other people that we know who, who aren't Christians. And the thing that we need more than anything every single day of our lives is God. We need to be turning to God and we need to be looking at his word on a regular basis. And if we don't, then we're going to find ourselves in a very, very bad place. We need to ask ourselves this morning, is God a priority in my life? Well, continuing now to verse 2, it says, Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling, of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Already here in the second verse of this epistle, Peter is, as they say, diving into the deep end of the theological pool. He is getting into these really tough doctrines already that many people wrestle with and have a hard time understanding. But one of the things we can be comforted in is that he is just introducing some of these things and some of that he's going to be expanding upon them as he goes on in his letter. Well, the first thing that we see in verse 2 is this word elect. So it's talking about this difficult, for some people, difficult doctrine of election, which is the idea of God choosing us before the foundation of the world to salvation and that we would then be saved. Dr. Alva J. McLean says this defining election, that it is the act of God whereby in sovereign grace... He appointed certain ones among mankind to salvation in Christ with all its accompanying blessings. Now, some have suggested in this verse that, as it says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, that election is in some way subordinate to the foreknowledge of God. And when they say this, they're saying that uh, salvation is based upon some supposedly passive foresight uh, on the part of God. That's what some people say. But what I want us to understand is this word foreknowledge itself uh, sometimes carries a different uh, or a slightly different shade of meaning than simply just passive foresight. It involves God's active consciousness of all that is to come to pass. Sometimes it carries with it the idea of centering one's attention on. And so this is talking about an intimate knowledge uh, of those who would come to believe on him. Speaking of Peter's first sermon of the church on the day of Pentecost, there was something that he said uh, in that sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Uh, it's, he said this, Him, speaking of Jesus, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. Well, there in his sermon, Peter was saying that Jesus' death on the cross was all a part of the plan of God. He knew that that was going to happen, and he planned it out that way and so that there would be a way that the, uh, the penalty for sin could be dealt with as Jesus would be 
uh, put on that cross, and he would take the sins of the world upon himself. And God had intimate knowledge of every detail of that uh, beforehand. But at the same time, Peter is preaching to the people who were listening to the sermon, and he is holding them responsible collectively uh, for for being the ones who crucified Jesus themselves. So even though you see, this is difficult, right? Even though God predetermined it and he planned it, yet the people who were listening to the sermon who crucified Jesus, may, many of them maybe were some of the same ones who, who said to crucify Jesus when they, he was standing before Pontius Pilate, uh, those people Peter was preaching to, they were still held responsible uh, for what they had done. Regardless, So we can see that the plans of God do not overrule the responsibility that we have as human beings uh, to obey God and to listen uh, to his word. We still need to choose to respond to him and his message. Well, something else about this word foreknowledge. Look forward in the first chapter of 1 Peter to the verse number 20. Verse 20, and it's talking about Jesus again. It says, He indeed was foreordained, some Bibles say foreknown, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Now, what I want to point out about this is that uh, this word foreordained or foreknowledge, it is another form of the same word we see in verse 2 when it says foreknowledge. And so what it's talking about there is the, the foreknowledge of God the Father that he had of Jesus Christ. And so obviously, since Jesus is God and he's eternal, he cannot have a time, there cannot be a time where Jesus didn't exist, where God the Father could have looked beforehand before Jesus existed and looked forward to what he would do uh, for him and that he would be the Savior. Uh, it can't be understood in that sense. This is talking about an intimate uh, relationship between God the Father and God the Son. It's talking about this, this, this relationship that's based upon his eternal plan. And so when we look at this, how it says in verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, we need to understand that it is not simply that um, God passively looked forward in time and then chose those same ones who he knew would believe. He did, he did choose us. Uh, to salvation, and he also foreknew that truth. Now, why is this important? When we're thinking about these really deep theological things, well, why does this matter when people are going through suffering and when they're going through persecution and when they're going through hard times and being challenged in their faith? Well, it's because uh, when people feel alone and isolated, God wants them to understand that they're not alone and that they're not isolated. And that we are, if you're a believer and if you are of the elect, then you are a part of the plan of God. And that should bring comfort to us. And that should bring some encouragement to us whenever we are going through a hard time. Now, something that helps me when I look at some of these difficult doctrines is to understand that there are certain verses in God's word that look at salvation as it, though it were from God's perspective looking down. That's what we're seeing here. We're seeing some truths about salvation from God's perspective looking down. Other times we see verses in God's word, like what I read with the kids, John 3, 16, that is presenting salvation to us from our perspective, looking up and our simple responsibility. But what we have here is we have a wonderful insight into the truths of God and how he saved us and all the, some things that uh, go in, in keeping with that that we wouldn't know unless God had told us to. Well, then he continues in verse 2, he says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we can stop right there. So based upon this verse, we can see, first of all, God the Father is mentioned, and we see the Spirit mentioned, and then we see Jesus Christ mentioned. Uh, this is obviously an early uh, indication of the doctrine of the Trinity and how God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what we're seeing here is how all three persons of the Trinity have a, an important role to play and were involved in our salvation in some way. So first of all, we see um, God the Father. We can see how he had foreknowledge. God the Father is the ultimate sovereign of the universe. Romans chapter 11, verse 36 says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Well, then the Holy Spirit, it says, in sanctification of the Spirit. 
Now, sometimes when we see the word sanctification, which just means to be set apart for a special purpose, that's what sanctification means. Sometimes it's talking about different aspects of our sanctification or of our salvation. And so sometimes sanctification is talking about our sanctification past, which is when we became saved. Sometimes it's talking about our sanctification present, which is how we're growing in our relationship with the Lord. And sometimes it's talking about sanctification future, which is talking about how we are glorified when we get to heaven. Well, here in the context is talking about a sanctification past and how we became saved. And so this is telling us about how we can be regenerated because of the Holy Spirit coming into our heart and into our life. And so how he causes us, he is the one who causes us to be born again. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. And so everything that's mentioned here leads us to the talking about Jesus Christ. Finally, it says, and obe for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, what God the Father did and what God the Holy Spirit did, also Jesus Christ did something for us and his blood was shed so that it would be accomplished, so that there could be a substitutionary sacrifice on the cross and so that the work of God could be accomplished so that we could be redeemed. And all we need to do, as it says, is obey him. We need to obey Jesus Christ. We need to come to believe what he said about himself and believe in the gospel about him. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And finally, at the end of verse 2, we can see uh, the formal greeting. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Uh, this was the, the normal Christian greeting that uh, we see often in the New Testament. Uh, grace was the normal greeting for the Greeks, and peace was the normal greeting for the Jews. And so one of the things the early church did was they, they put together those two greetings together uh, so that they would say both. And obviously, we can understand that um, we need to have the grace of God, and when we have the grace of God, then that brings peace uh, in our lives. I mentioned earlier about the occasion when uh, Jesus told Peter uh, that Satan was going to sift him like wheat. This was right before I mentioned earlier uh, the denial, uh, how Peter denied Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. And so Jesus told Peter that Satan was going to sift him like wheat, and uh, we might think to ourselves, well, uh, Jesus ought to say that he's not going to let that happen. <laughs> he's not going to let Satan do anything bad to him. Uh, but what he did say was, I have prayed for you, that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Peter uh, really went through some hard times, even to the end of his life, where tradition tells us that uh, Peter was crucified, and that's how he died, as a martyr. But instead of being crucified uh, upright like normal, we're told that he asked and requested that he would be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to be crucified the same way that his Savior was. And really, that would have just ended his life sooner. You see, God doesn't always deliver us from our trials. When we're going through something hard, oftentimes we think to ourselves that we need to be delivered from it. Uh, we think to ourselves that we need to be rescued or that we need to be relieved but God sometimes wants us to go through that trial. He wants us to enjoy, endure uh, that trial. And so what we have to do is train ourselves to focus on God's word, what it is that it says, and so that we can be ready when those times come. And that's the purpose of these scriptures that we're reading here and that we're going to be seeing in the coming weeks, Lord willing, is things that we can be comforted in whenever we're going through uh, a hard time. And so God's desire is for that. We can ask uh, a question. Do we have the kind of faith that is genuine and that can stand strong even in the face of impending persecution from the world? Or do we have the kind of faith which cracks under such pressure? There was once a man who met a pastor on the street one day, and during their conversation, he told him all the troubles he had been having through the last year. He had such a bad year. Uh, and there were so many things that went wrong with him. And so after he had spilled the beans to the pastor, he ended with, I tell you right now, preacher, 
It's enough for a man to lose his religion. And in response, calmly, the pastor said, it seems to me that everything you've told me is reason enough to make a man use his religion. We sometimes serve God, but we get to, to a place, if we aren't close with him, where we're serving him, but only in an advisory capacity. But really what God wants is all of us. He wants to use us in whatever way that he would present as opportunity to us, even if it might be uncomfortable for us, even if we think we're not ready, if he's asked us to do it, then that means we need to do it. Uh, the tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon, it's that we wait so long before getting started. And so again, Peter's desire as he wrote this epistle is that we, he could strengthen the brethren so that we could be ready for hard times, so that we could be more equipped to handle the things that God has coming for us. And so we need to be looking at his word, God's word, so that we can find the grace and help in time of need. And so a final question, are you prepared to follow Christ no matter what hardships might come in this life? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this portion of your word and the challenge that it is. I pray that you would indeed help us in the days to come, that we would be faithful to you and that we would be able to serve you to the best of our ability and in a way that honors you, and that we would rely on you for our strength and not on ourselves. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.